What's going on, you 3D modeling beasts? This is JL Musi, and welcome to part one of creating stylized environmental art using Maya, ZBrush, and Substance Painter. This is a five-part series sponsored by Autodesk, and it will document my entire workflow for creating stylized environmental art that is ready to be taken into a game engine. The aim of this whole series was to be able to take any reference, any idea, or even an existing model that you might have and apply certain stylized characteristics to be able to create your own unique stylized art. If you get any value from this video, please consider smashing that like button as it does help the channel grow tremendously. And if you're interested in following along with this project, I've made available for free the complete set of project files. I will have a link in the description down below on how you could access those files. In this first video of the series, I will give you a proper outline of the complete series so you can know exactly what to expect moving forward. Just like developing a well-rounded physique will require you to learn and master more than one specific piece of gym equipment, creating a video game asset that is polished and optimized will require you to master more than one stage in a 3D pipeline within a specific package. I've divided each of these videos into specific stages within the 3D asset creation pipeline. You will see how each of these specific stages can actually be thought of like specific pieces of weight training equipment. Episode number one, the instruction manual, gathering and creating reference. Before starting to use home gym equipment like this, it must be properly put together following the instructions manual. Just like following the instructions, will allow you for a smooth assembly of your equipment. Closely following reference will allow for a smooth creation process of your 3D stylized art. It will give you a clear sense of direction of where your project is headed, and it will also give you a clear visual target to shoot for. In this video, I will break down my entire reference gathering and creation process. This includes style sheet creation, how to take your own reference photos and blueprint creation. I will also break down the elements of stylized art that I think are most important. Episode number two, the barbell. Creating a block out in Maya. The three fundamental lifts for building strength are the squat, the bench, and the deadlift. All these are compound movements that are performed with a single basic piece of gym equipment the Olympic barbell. Many athletes start weight training with the barbell as the foundation to their strength training routines. Just like the barbell, creating a block out should be the foundation of any good 3D model. The block out is a simple representation of your model. But like many things in life, there is beauty in simplicity. It will help you quickly nail down basic proportions, get a feel, of your model's final look and avoid many issues down your 3D asset creation pipeline. In this video, I will walk you step by step through my entire block out phase within Maya. Episode number three, the dumbbell. High poly sculpting and ZBrush. Concentration movements in the bodybuilding world are specific exercises designed to add that extra level of detail to an already well-built physique. These exercises are often performed with a dumbbell since they allow you to concentrate on one side of the body. Just like a bodybuilder utilizes a dumbbell to perform a concentration exercise to add that extra bit of muscle detail to an already well-built physique, creating a high poly sculpt within ZBrush will help you add that extra level of detail on top of your already established block out. This high poly sculpt will act as the base for our textures details. In this third video, 
I will show you how I create my high poly sculpt to create my stylized details within ZBrush while sharing my brushes, tools, and workflows. Episode number four, the bench and the rack, creating the low poly and UVs in Maya. The bench must be well built to support the lifter's body weight, yet lightweight enough to be moved around the gym and properly adjusted to perform different exercises. Just like the bench, the low poly must be well built to support all the high poly details, but lightweight in the poly count to be able to be thrown in a game engine and rendered in real time. The weight rack must be well created to hold up a standard 300 pound Olympic barbell weight set. A poorly built weight stand will not support the weight correctly and if the weight rack fails, it might hurt the lifter. Just like the weight rack, a poorly built UV set will hurt the texturing process by having distorted textures and not allowing maximum texture resolution due to poor UV efficiency. In this fourth installment of the series, I will show you my workflow for creating an optimized low poly mesh and creating a UV set that will properly support great stylized textures. Episode number five, the curl bar. Creating stylized textures in Substance Painter. The curl bar has one primary purpose, to help build bigger arms. A bodybuilder's arms can be seen virtually from any angle, the front, the back, and the sides. A weak set of arms can also diminish the overall quality of a bodybuilder's physique. Textures can also be seen from any angle and a weak set of textures will dramatically diminish the overall quality of your 3D model. Just like a bodybuilder that uses the curl bar to build a great set of arms, a 3D artist can use a package like Substance Painter to carve out a great set of stylized 3D textures. In this fifth and final installment of the series, I will break down my entire workflow for creating a strong set of great looking stylized 3D textures. Let's go ahead and break down my entire reference gathering and creation process. Like I mentioned earlier, this reference process can be thought of just like the instructional manual to put together that home gym equipment. The first step in this reference process is to create a style sheet. A style sheet is essentially a visual target for the style that you're aiming to create. So what we're gonna do is essentially scour the internet for a bunch of different images that closely resemble this style. Once we gathered all these references from these different sources, we're gonna throw them into a package specifically created for references called Pure Ref. And essentially we're gonna build a sheet of different photos or different images and we're gonna be able to quickly access it with Pure Ref. And it's gonna be an invaluable resource as we go through this model creation process. The first thing that we're gonna set out to do is find these images. I mainly use three sources for this. One is ArtStation. So I'll go into the search and I'll type in something like stylized environment or stylized art, stylized props, anything that closely resembles what I'm looking for. The second source that I like to use, and it has a community feature with different artists, is called the area. And this a lot of times does have different artists that you might not find on ArtStation. So I'll head over to the area and I'll do a very similar search for stylized art. And I'll start downloading images from the area and basically start throwing them into Pure Ref. And lastly, I do use Google Image Search. The great thing about Google Image Search, not only can you search the entire web for a specific keyword, but also it has a very nifty search tool function. And within it, you could actually specify higher res images. So a lot of times if you're searching the web and you're getting very, very small thumbnails, it's hard to actually use as a clean reference. So that filter, to basically search for larger image sizes is really a great benefit if you're basically looking for 3D reference. So once we're done searching for all these images from different sources, 
we can go ahead and quickly throw them over to peer ref organize them and have essentially the style sheet that is going to be the backbone of this visual target through the rest of the modeling process i will go ahead and have a link to download pure ref for free it is a free software that any 3d artist can use once we have created this style sheet the next task is going to be to get photographs of the specific assets that we're looking to create and for this you can simply repeat a google image search for the specific items that you're looking to create but in my case i opted to take my own photographs and if you have access to the physical asset, I think this is one of the best ways of gathering reference because it allows you to do a couple things. One is to actually get multiple angles of the same asset, which if you're searching the internet, you know that can be very hard to do. Secondly, you can have all these assets within multiple angles with the same lighting source which is actually pretty um, significant since different lighting a lot of times can actually throw you off. And the third reason for this, which is pretty important as well, is that if you have a relatively new camera or even a relatively new phone, and now most phones are actually equipped with very high-end cameras, you could actually have really high resolution photos which searching the internet sometimes can be a challenge with finding super high res reference images for your modeling projects. So now I'm gonna give you some specific photography tips that will ensure that you have some great reference images to work from. One is that you actually get enough reference. What I typically recommend, especially if you're shooting multiple props all at once, is that you try to physically separate the props uh, meaning that they're not next to each other. So each prop can be isolated. Ultimately, what this will allow you to do is get multiple elevation points from the same angle. For example, in this side of you here, you'll see the bench and what most 3D artists, when they usually start out, they just think that they need a side of view. But when you actually start modeling, you'll often come to know that you actually need more visual information. That's why I typically recommend bare minimum that for example, for this side of you here, not only do you get the side at a neutral elevation point, but you actually get a high angle for this side and actually a low angle. And this will give you a more complete view that's gonna be easier to translate these 2D images into a 3D object. Here's a complete list of bare minimum angles that you should be looking to photograph for your object and each of these angles is going to have at least three of those elevation points a high angle a neutral angle and a low angle once you took all the reference images for your projects i personally do like to have this extra level of reference in the form of a side blueprint what the side blueprint allows me to do is have an image distortion free that I can put in the side orthographic camera of my 3D modeling application. And this does help me, especially in the block out phase, to really establish the basic proportions very quickly instead of having to eyeball just images on a side monitor. You're obviously welcome to create multiple blueprint angles. I usually find that the dominant side or the long side of most projects are actually good enough to do instead of having to essentially create a blueprint for the side, the front, and the top. I use a vector package like Adobe Illustrator to actually build out my blueprints. One tip for creating photographs specifically for blueprint creation is to actually try to minimize the lens distortion within your camera. This could actually be achieved a couple of ways. One of the simplest ways, especially if you're shooting on your phone, to basically reduce distortion on it is to actually have the object that you're photographing for your blueprints as far as possible, and then actually just zoom in a little bit. And here you'll see a comparison of an item. See that there's a lot of lens distortion, especially because the camera is relatively closer. Just by me putting this bench a little bit further and zooming in, 
you see how much closer to a 3D orthographic view this actually looks. If you have a higher end DSLR with a detachable lens, what you could actually do is adjust the focal length of that camera to be higher. So focal lengths around 35, you'll see that that is pretty much a default focal length for your perspective camera. But if you switch over to the orthographics view, you'll see that usually these focal lengths are a lot higher. Before I end the video, I wanna cover the elements of stylized art. Separating each of these elements and knowing exactly what to look for will better suit you to turn any idea, any reference, or any previous model that you might have, apply these elements and end up with a great looking stylized piece. The first element that we're gonna take a look at is stylized edges. If we take a look at this uh, piece right here by Michael Vicente, we're gonna know a very distinctive look to each of these edges. They're very prominent in the texture, so you'll see a very faint outline around them, which really makes it pop and give it a stylized look. You also see that it varies in width and also does have quite a bit of variation, including some damage. And this is an element that you'll often find in many stylized pieces. The second stylized element here that I wanna focus on is the flat colors. So stylized art, a lot of it tends to be flatter uh, as far as the specularity. So if we're correlating this to a substance painter workflow, the metallic values would actually be shifted down and the roughness values would be shifted up compared to a more of a photorealistic workflow. Stylized element number three that I wanna discuss is distorted proportions. Just like a portrait artist who does caricatures might take all the essentially features of a person's face, but actually play around with the proportions this actually carries over to a lot of stylized environmental art as well. So if we take a look at this stylized piece by Angelo here, you'll notice that these bricks are relatively gigantic compared to the smaller building. And this deviation from the normal proportions of a normal set of bricks that would be on a building like this help give this asset a stylized look. The last element of stylized art that I want to go into is squash and stretch. So a lot of pieces of stylized environmental art, a lot of times seem like they have this curvature, this squashing going on. Usually towards the top of the element, they actually flare outwards. I'm looking at this uh, great piece by Pejman, and we'll note that a lot of these assets, especially if we focus on these assets, towards the back wall. And we look at this little bookcase on the right corner, we kind of see that squash and stretching going on. We'll also see it on that large table and we'll see this squash and stretch actually be repeated many times across the different elements within this attic. You see by adding the squash and stretch feel to our objects, we get a great stylized look. And this is something that I cover in depth in part two when we go and actually create the block out for these stylized assets. That's all the time that I have for you folks. Thank you so much for tuning in to part one of creating stylized environmental art using Maya, ZBrush, and Substance Painter. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and you're truly pumped to create your own stylized art. No pun intended there. If you're ready to move on, and catch part two of the series, you can click the card right here. This is gonna take you to the next video in the series where I'll walk you step by step on how to create your own block out using Maya to create your very own stylized environmental art. That's all the time that I have for you folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until we meet again, I will catch you next time.